If you were to open up your fridge or pantry and pull out any food package, when you flip it over, chances are you would find a nutrition facts label, displaying relative amounts of certain nutrients that you would find in that food. Isn't it crazy to think that everything you need to know about nutrition fits on that little label? Well, I wish I could tell you that was true. I wish I could honestly tell you that it was that simple, and that there was only about 10 nutrients that you needed to consume to live a healthy and optimal life. But sadly, that's not the case. Because there's also all of these. And more. Now, some of us actually find this stuff interesting. Personally, this list actually kind of fascinates me, but for the majority of you people that are still sane, this can look a little overwhelming. Fortunately, as with a lot of things in life, when you get the big stuff right, the rest of it tends to fall into place. Nutrition is really not that different, and that's what this new series of mine is hoping to assist with. To identify and help you to understand the true nutrients. Now, I would be willing to bet that if you asked any person involved in fitness or nutrition for advice, every single one of them would say something about protein. Seems like a pretty good place to start. Protein is one of the three main macronutrients, contributing 4 calories per gram. The recommended daily allowance for protein is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, but realistically this can and should vary wildly depending on your build and goals. Now if you're watching this video, chances are that means you're alive, which means that you are consuming some kind of protein on a regular basis. However, it's estimated that between 15 to 20 percent of the world's population doesn't get enough for the body to maintain itself properly. And not all protein is necessarily created equally as well. The proteins that the human body needs are made up of compounds called amino acids, essentially building blocks that the body uses in different chain orders to make different proteins with different uses. When you consume protein, your digestive system uses enzymes to break it down into the individual amino acids that are then absorbed and built back up into over 10,000 different types of proteins that the body uses from different arrangements of these amino acids. Now you may be thinking that's a lot of different kinds of proteins, and you'd be right. Protein in some form is involved in pretty much every function that takes place in your body. So let's take a look at a few of those, shall we? Protein is responsible for 10 primary functions that, like I said, are involved with pretty much everything in the body. Now, when most people think of protein, they think of building muscle, and for good reason, as the first function of protein is growth and maintenance, especially of muscle tissue. Muscle proteins are constantly being broken down, from exercise, yes, but also this is just a natural occurrence. Your body needs a consistent supply of protein to keep a balanced rate of breakdown and building, and a slight surplus in order to build muscle, which comes with its own benefits like increased strength and stamina, a faster metabolism, and looking and feeling more attractive, which, let's be honest, matters. Function number two of protein is the role they play as enzymes. Enzymes are a type of protein that aids with biochemical reactions that take place in the body. The structure of enzymes allows them to combine with molecules called substrates to catalyze or speed up bodily processes. There's many different types of enzymes used for digestion, blood clotting, muscular contraction, energy production, the list goes on. The third function is hormones, proteins that act as chemical messengers performing communication between cells, tissues, and organs. In fact, polypeptides, which are made from chains of amino acids, make up the majority of the body's hormones, including insulin, glucagon, human growth hormone, melatonin, antidiuretic hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and various thyroid hormones. Function number four is structure, specific proteins that provide cells and tissues with stiffness and rigidity. These include keratin, collagen, and elastin. Number five is transportation and storage of nutrients. These include hemoglobin, proteins found in red blood cells that carry oxygen from the lungs to the tissues, lipoproteins, your HDL and LDL, which carry cholesterol throughout the body, glucose transporters, whose function is pretty obvious, casein, which stores amino acids, and ferritin, which stores iron. Function number six is immune health in the form of immunoglobulins, a type of protein that acts as an antibody, combating harmful bacteria, viruses, diseases, and infections. Number seven is fluid balance, notably albumin, a protein in your blood that attracts and retains water. Number eight is wound healing. When you get an injury that pierces the skin, several proteins come into play like bradykinin, which dilates blood vessels at the wound, fibrin, which secures platelets that form a blood clot, and the mending of scar tissue is made largely of collagen. Number nine is acidity regulation, with proteins like hemoglobin binding to acids, helping to stabilize your body's overall pH levels. And lastly, protein can be used for energy, but it is kind of a last resort and is really only used when other energy sources like carbohydrates have run dry. So as you can see, protein is arguably the most essential nutrient there is, as every bodily function would cease to work properly without it. 
Fortunately, as long as you consume enough of the right amino acids, your body will generally take care of the rest. And let's take a closer look at those amino acids. As I said, amino acids are like the building blocks of proteins. They're organic compounds that proteins get broken down into when digested and built back in different chains after being absorbed. Although there are over 500 unique amino acids that have been identified in nature, the human body only needs a specific 20 to build all the different proteins it needs to operate. But it does need all 20. 11 of these the body can make entirely on its own, leaving 9 that you need to consume. These are called the essential amino acids. Histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. However, you do not need all of these in equal amounts. According to the World Health Organization, the recommended amount to consume of each essential amino acid per kilogram of body weight is as follows. Now, when a protein source contains all essential amino acids in sufficient amounts, it's called a complete protein. Consuming complete proteins regularly can make it easier to make sure that you are getting all nine. However, realistically, simply eating enough protein almost guarantees that this will happen too. But certain restrictive diets with limited protein sources may struggle with this. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of those foods that people rely on for protein. First, let's take a look at animal-based protein sources. Animal products are always considered complete sources of protein due to containing all nine essential amino acids in ratios that are conducive for the body to use. When I say animal products, we're referring to meats, poultry, fish, shellfish, eggs, dairy, and anything else that can be considered an animal. Obviously, different animal products provide different protein quantities and some variation in amino acid profiles, but animal products as a whole are considered the highest quality protein sources. They're easier to consume, usually having higher protein concentrations per gram, and they tend to be more bioavailable, being more easily absorbed by the body than plant protein. There's no particular downside to animal proteins themselves, but there potentially is an over-reliance on certain animal products. Fish and shellfish may be high in heavy metals like mercury, or microplastics. Mammalian meats, dairy, and eggs may contribute more calories from fat than you'd like, and many high-protein processed products that are easy to eat or prepare can come with their own problems, notably smoking or carcinogenic preservatives or preparation methods. So for good quality animal protein, some form of prep or cooking will almost always be required. But as a whole, animal protein is tough to beat, and the most reliable sources of it often come with a wide array of other essential nutrients and compounds as well. Now, plant proteins are a whole other topic. The majority of reliable plant proteins lack a sufficient amount of at least one essential amino acid, making them what's referred to as an incomplete protein. I'll have a list of some of the most common plant proteins on screen once again comparing protein per gram and per calorie as well as the specific amino acid that the food tends to lack. For any foods that are not on this list that you're wondering about, this information is really not that hard to find. So if you were to say only eat lentils as your protein source, you would have an extremely hard time consuming methionine, its limiting amino acid, and your body could fail due to it not having what it needs to make the proper proteins. And there are some plant foods that are considered complete sources of protein, including soy, quinoa, buckwheat, spirulina, chia seeds, and lupin beans, and there are more, but again, you can look those up. Fortunately, if you're on a plant-based diet, you generally don't have to worry about pairing foods with specific amino acids as long as you eat a diverse array of plant foods. Variety and quantity together are generally good enough, but plant protein is often just much more difficult than animal protein. This is only compounded by the fact that they are often less bioavailable. If you choose to go on a plant-based diet, rest assured that protein is doable, just a lot less convenient. And if you're not exclusively on a plant-based diet, you can feel free to use them supplementally. Speaking of supplements, I don't think it's fair to make this video without addressing them. Protein supplementation is becoming a more and more common practice. Most protein supplements come from whey, a protein isolated from milk, which is turned into powder. Some may contain enough lactose to cause problems for those with lactose intolerance. Many will not. It all depends on the processing. Whey protein is considered to be good for muscle growth due to being a more reliable source of branched-chain amino acids, or BCAAs, notably valine, leucine, and isoleucine. These are shown to increase muscle growth and reduce muscle soreness and exercise fatigue. Whey also tends to come with its own unique antibacterial and antiviral benefits. Plant-based protein supplementation most commonly comes from rice, 
pea, soy, or hemp, or often a combination of these. You do need to watch out for gluten intolerance or allergies to soy or any other potential ingredients. Many studies have shown plant-based protein supplements can be just as effective for muscle building as long as its protein and BCAA contents are the same. Protein supplementation is very common and for good reason. For many people, hitting that raw number goal can be very difficult and an extra 20 to 30 grams can make a world of difference. But protein supplementation is called that for a reason. It should not be your primary source of protein over actual food. So by now I hope I've convinced you that protein is really important, and that your intake of it should be a priority if you care at all about your nutrition. So the only question I had left was, can you consume too much protein? And the answer is, technically yes, but it's pretty difficult to do so. This is for a few reasons. First, protein makes you feel more full than carbohydrates. Second, protein takes more energy to digest and absorb than carbohydrates and fats. And lastly, when you consume more protein than you need, your body can undergo a process called gluconeogenesis, which converts protein into glucose to be used for energy. But I'm not going to get too into that because gluconeogenesis honestly deserves an entire video to itself. This all being said, too much protein can limit you from consuming other nutrients as there does come a point where protein just isn't really that useful. And in more extreme cases, excess protein may contribute to dehydration, lead to calcium loss, or worsen kidney conditions in those with pre-existing issues. How much protein you need can vary wildly on a number of things. Weight, fat content, sex, goals, age, activity level, the list goes on. A generally agreed upon safe upper limit is 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, but many experts believe the average person can handle even more without repercussion. And there you have it, everything I really have to say about protein. The reality of it is, protein is the nutrient above all nutrients. The one you can almost always fall back on when creating a meal plan. The one that if you don't get right, very little of what you do beyond it is going to matter. It plays some kind of role in almost every bodily function and should be one of the first, if not the first thing you should consider when starting a new diet or nutrition goal. Now if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe because there's plenty more of these on the way. Go ahead and leave down in the comments any other nutrient that you think deserves an in-depth breakdown like this one. And remember that all I ask is that you do your own research and advocate for your body. You only get the one.